This is problem number 32. It's on page 628. Design a helical torsion spring for average service using stainless steel wire, ASTM A313 type 302, to exert a torque of a pound inch after deflection of 180 degrees from the free condition. The outside diameter of the coil should be no more than a half inch. Specify the diameter of a rod on which to mount the spring. Okay. So this is for average service. It's, the material is ASTM A313, should be separated, which is a stainless steel. It's type 302. We know that the operating moment, now remember for extension and compression springs, we talk about operating forces, but for torsion springs, there's an operating moment or a torque. It needs to be an inch pound at a deflection of 180 degrees. Now, again, be careful about this because in a linear spring, like a compression or extension spring, the deflection is a linear straight line deflection, but in a torsion spring, the deflection is a twist angle, right? So a 180 degree twist angle needs to develop one inch pound of torque. So this, by the way, of course, is one half revolution. And then the maximum outside diameter is one half inch. All right, so now we need to decide on what spring design we'll choose. How will we do this? So what's the wire diameter? What's the mean diameter? The rod size, the number of active coils, all those things. And most of the time what you do is you start off with a reasonable range of stress that the material you're given can take. And a lot of times the, the selected material is something you have to decide on. So how would you decide? Well, a lot of times you have to decide based on either past experience with a similar design or with the environment that the spring will operate in. Obviously, a stainless steel spring is going to be a little more expensive, okay, but it won't corrode. So maybe this is a, a corrosive environment. At least most stainlesses are pretty resistant to rusting. Some stainless is more so than others. So now we have to select a wire uh, size and stress and all that stuff. Where do we go to start? Well, be careful about this because for torsional springs, the figures we go to for material properties are different than the ones we go to for compression and extension springs. So we have to go to other charts in our book and be really careful. Make sure you go to the correct ones. Maybe we'll want to highlight on the the face of these charts, it says torsion springs. I'm on page 621 and uh, all the way through 623. And I'm looking for ASTM 313, which is stainless, and I think that's the last one. Yeah, page 623, figure 18-29. We want the average service curve. So my usual approach is to look at the highest and lowest points on the curve. Highest point is about 190. Lowest point is about 80, and go about halfway between those two. When I did that, I got a design stress starting point of very roughly, let's do it this way, approximately equal to 135,000 PSI. So that's about where I'm going to start. That's about how much stress I expect to apply to the spring. Now, I have a requirement for the maximum outside diameter. So, I think what I'm going to do is say, I'm going to set the mean diameter. You know, let's do that over here because we're making choices over here. I'm just going to set the mean diameter to 0 0.45 inches. And that way, as long as my spring wire is not more than 50 thousandths, then it ought to fit inside of the half inch requirement. So, that's all right. And then I can calculate, oh, and I'm also going to set the wall correction factor to 1.15. Now, you might look at this and say, well, where the heck did that come from? Well, that's a good question. For torsion springs, the wall correction factor is the bending wall correction factor. Because remember, with a torsion spring, the material is wrapped up in a coil, and as you torque it, you're actually bending it. It's like a beam, and you're basically taking those coils and you're bending them farther. 
Okay? So you, normally you, you make them get smaller, essentially. That's the way the torsion springs are usually loaded. What you'll notice about the wall correction factor is we still have a spring index requirement or suggestion that it be between 5 and 12. The wall correction factor doesn't vary a whole lot across that range of 5 to 12. It does vary, but there's, it's not like you can change the wall correction factor extensively by changing the spring index. Yeah, it changes a little bit, but not much. So this is a good starting point for a, a good spring, one that has a, a good um, spring index, and it's about what you're going to get anyway. So that's something worth noting is that your wall correction factor is going to be about 1.15 no matter what you do. Now, obviously, it does vary depending on your wire diameter and your mean diameter, but that's a good starting point. So now I can use the equation to calculate a starting wire diameter, 32 over pi. I guess I should write this down where it came from. Uh, let's see. Go into the textbook. Uh, let's see, here we are. Page 624, there's an equation uh, unmarked. Oh, he already uh, he already gave it to us. 1819. Yeah, here we are. So page 620, equation 1819. And you know what? I've already made a mistake, didn't I? I put a shear stress here, but I'm reading off of a chart that is giving me normal stress. That's a fundamental mistake. That's a big problem. It's not a six. This is a sigma. Because remember, I've said it, and I <laughs> and I made that mistake. We're bending the wire, right? So we need to compare it to the, the normal stress that the material can take, not a shear stress. No apologies. So that stress on the y-axis from the chart or, or the figure I read off was a normal stress or a bending stress. But figure 1819 reminded me of that because what we've done here is rearrange this equation to solve for the wire diameter. So we ended up with the, let's see, the moment, uh, the operating moment, I believe, and the wall correction factor, and then in the denominator, we've got the bending stress. This is all to the one-third power. Okay. So when I plug in numbers here, I'll get uh, 32. The moment is one inch pound. The bending, or yeah, bending wall correction factor is 1.15 divided by pi divided by the allowable design stress in bending of 135,000. PSI, and all of this then, as I said, is raised to the one-third power. Okay, so inch, pounds, force. The pounds force will cancel. We have per square inch, so we have inches cubed to the one-third power is just inches. And so the wire diameter comes out to um, 0 0.0443 inches. Now I need to find a standard wire size, and I'll just choose something close to that. So now let's see, let's go to the standard wire diameters, page 598. Now we're dealing with stainless steel, so which, which uh, column should we be on? Well, stainless steel is just a steel wire, so we use the steel wire gauge. It's the US steel wire gauge. So we're looking for something at about 44 thousandths or so. And let's see, it looks like uh, 47 and a half thousandths, uh, 41 thousandths are available. I'm going to choose something close. I'm going to choose 18 gauge so that I end up almost right on top of the estimate of the wire downer. So I'm going to use or choose. 0.0475 inch, which is 18 gauge wire. Okay, so I'm not using this one. This was just to get me in the ballpark. And so now, so now I can calculate my outside diameter and make sure everything will be all right. Let's check it because remember we've got to meet this specification. So the mean diameter plus the wire diameter will give us the outside diameter. So 450 thousandths plus 47 and a half thousandths gives you about 0 0.498 inches. 
Now this is technically less than a half an inch, but how much space is that? A half inch versus 498 thousandths, that's only two thousandths of clearance. A sheet of paper is three or four thousandths of an inch, but two thousandths is a half of a sheet of paper. And that's, that's the diametral amount, right? The radial clearance, the amount on each side, is going to be about a thousandth of an inch. This is a very tight fit. This is probably not a very good design, but I'm going to keep going with it. So this is the typical engineer that just graduated from college and is saying, well, that's, there's a thousandth of an inch. That's clearance, isn't it? How much tolerance do you think there is when you take wire and you wind it around a mandrel and then it springs back, right, to its final dimensions? And then eat up those two thousandths of an inch in a heartbeat. But let's make the mistake and move on. So to get the spring index, we'll take the ratio of the... Um, mean diameter and the wire diameter, and that comes out to about 9.47, so that's okay, it's between 5 and 12. And now our actual bending wall correction factor, which is 4C squared minus C minus 1, divided by 4C times C minus 1, comes out to about 1.085. Again, not very far from 1.15. Doesn't change the numbers and the equations much at all. Now to calculate the operating stress, 32M operating K bending divided by pi wire diameter cubed. It's another wire diameter. I know the correct bending factor, or the correct wall correction factor for bending. Now I can calculate the operating stress that I'll actually experience. So 32, I'm going to eliminate the units. I'll show you what I'm doing. Pi wire diameter 0.04. 75 inches cubed, we come up with about 103,160 PSI. Okay, now that uh, is less than, let's see, oh, we haven't gotten our, our uh, actual stress that's allowed. Uh, this is not the number, that was just to get it started. We need to compare against how much stress the actual wire diameter we selected can take. So let's go back to the figure and look it up. So page 621 is not it. Here it is, page 623, figure 1829, where we were before. If we look up on the x-axis, a wire diameter, where is it, of 100, and, well not 100, but 47 and a half thousandths, so 0.04. Let's see, 0.04 is halfway between 0.02 and 0.06, so a little bit to the right of that. For average service, looks like we're certainly above 160, maybe 165 KSI. So sigma uh, for average service, given the wire diameter, is about uh, 165,000 PSI. That's the the, the stress that the wire should be able to take on a regular basis. Since this stress is less than that, this is the actual stress that we'll experience, it's less than the stress that it, we could give the wire, then everything's okay. So this is greater than the operating stress. So that's, that's a good thing. That's a check mark. Now I'd like to come up with the number of active coils. The number of active coils for a um, torsional spring is the elastic modulus times the wire diameter to the fourth over 10.2 mean diameter times the operating or the, uh, the, the spring constant, the rotational spring constant. Now where did this equation come from? Well, let's see. If you go to page 620 and look at equation 1822, what I've done is rearranged the equation. And really, it's equation 1821 also rearranged. So 1821 is kind of like the equation we had before, where the deflection of the spring and the force were separate, but you could put the two together and come up with the spring rate, okay, or the, the spring constant. In the same way, equation 1821 has the moment in it separate from the deflection, where the deflection is now the theta, it's the, the angular deflection. 
But the ratio of those two moment over theta is the, the angular spring constant, right? K theta. Because really what you've got is moment equals K theta times deflection. So there's our, our load. There's our angular deflection. There's the spring constant. It's just a linear spring. It's just a torsion spring. And you're probably used to dealing with uh, linear extension springs and compression springs where you're talking about a position deflection, not an angular deflection. But this works the same way. It's still a linear spring in the sense that the moment and the uh, deflection, which is an angular deflection, are linearly related to each other. But just the ratio of the moment to the uh, uh, angular deflection is the spring constant. So we've got this equation. It's great. The only problem is we don't have that spring constant, do we? At least not yet. How could we get it? Let's see, let me get rid of some of this and kind of start over. In fact, yeah, I guess I'll start there. So. So. Well, it'd just be the operating moment divided by the operating deflection, right? So that's simple. So the operating moment is an inch pound force. The deflection is one half revolution. So that is two inch pounds revolution. Simple. So now that we've got that, we can calculate the number of active coils required, oh, except one thing, we need the elastic modulus. You might say, well, I've got that one memorized now. It's 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. Well, for springs, we've got to be a bit more precise than that. So let's get our material properties table. You can hear me flipping through the book. Hopefully you're smarter than me and you've already bookmarked this page with a tab. I still haven't found it. Here we go. Page 606. We're looking for stainless steel. Now there's two rows for stainless steel. There's one that has type 302, 304, and 316. Another one that has type 17-7 pH. I don't even know what 17-7 pH is. It's a type of stainless steel I suppose I've never used. That's okay. Plenty of materials I've never used. In any case, ours is 302, so the tension modulus, or Young's modulus, or the elastic modulus, is 28 times 10 to the 6 psi. Yeah, it's close to 30 times 10 to the 6 psi, but it's not. It's 28 times 10 to the 6 psi. Okay. So that's the elastic modulus. The wire diameter was 0, 0.0, what was it, 47? Is that what I did? Yeah. 475 inches. That has to be not cubed, but to the fourth. Divided by 10.2. The mean diameter is 0 0.45 inches. That's something I specified a while back. And I've just calculated 2 inch pounds of force per revolution. Okay, so we've got PSI here, pounds force per square inch. Now, this is not a square, this is a two that's multiplying. So let's see, we've got uh, inches to the fourth over inches squared. So the numerator is pounds per square inches divided by square inches. The square inches are away, or they're gone. So all the inches are now gone. And you can see the pounds force cancel. And we'll just get revolutions. And then you can look at these as revolutions or coils, numbers of counts. Okay. Be really careful because you always need your spring. Uh, uh, rate, your spring constant, to be in moment per revolution. Otherwise, you won't get revolutions or numbers of coils. Okay? If you have radians here, for example, then you'll get radians of coils. Okay? You've got to be really careful about that. I prefer revolutions because then I can just, it's just a one to one conversion to counts or numbers of coils. Anyway, this comes out to about 15.53 coils, which Seems reasonable to me. And so now that I've got information about the number of active coils required, is that how many coils I'm going to put in the body of this spring? Well, remember that a, uh, a torsional spring usually has some end treatment. Let's see how I don't want to draw this. Well, I guess what you can see is that. It has an end treatment so that there are arms or something coming off either end. If there is significant length 
to these arms, they will also bend, right? Because this is the part of the beam that hasn't been wrapped around the mandrel. The, the whole spring is a beam, right? It's just been wrapped up, so it doesn't take up as much space. And as you apply force times distance, which gives you the moment, well, this length here acts like a little bit of coil. So the question is, how much in treatment will I have? Therefore, how much effective coil will I have just in the in treatments themselves? Obviously, if the end treatments have practically no length, if they're just a little, you know, tip of wire sticking out, out of the board at you, uh, in the same direction as the axis of the body, then they don't provide anything. But I'm going to choose one inch for the length of my the, the arms on the end of my spring. And so now I can calculate the number of effective coils that these arms add. Now, I haven't calculated, I mean, I've got the number of active coils I need, but if the arms are going to act like part of these coils, I need to know how much they contribute. Because the number of coils I put in the body, let me give you a quick preview. The number of coils I put in the body is going to be the number of active coils required minus the number of effective coils that the two arms already provide. And it may be significant. So let's find out. Well, the effective number of coils for the arms at the end, let's see, there's an equation here somewhere for it. Here it is. Your author, I don't think, has an equation number for this. It's in an example problem. It's on page 624 for sure. And I think it's buried there and not in the body of the text, if I remember correctly. Yeah, here it is. So this is this is something that you will want to mark down. Unless I've missed it in the chapter, this is the only place I've seen it. Page 624, look at step 7. No, he does have it. He references the equation number 1823. I just missed it. Yeah, here we go. Okay, let's go back to page 720 instead. So equation 1823 is the one I'm looking for. And it goes like this. The number of effective coils is the length of one of the arms plus the length of the other arm divided by 3 pi mean diameter. So I didn't write down that obviously this would be the same thing as L2. Okay? I guess the force wouldn't have to be applied out at the end, but certainly the arm has some length. Wherever the force is applied, that's the effective length. Because if you apply the force way down here, obviously this section doesn't contribute to bending. But we're just assuming the force is applied out at the end. Why well, have extra material unless you're going to apply the force way out at the end of the tip. Anyway, so the length uh, sum is two inches, because I just made both arms one inch long. Three pi, mean diameter 0 0.45 inches. And so the number of effective coils is pretty small, 0 0.47. This, these two arms provide less than half of an effective coil. So the number of coils required in the body then would be 15.53 coils minus 0.47 coils. Now if you know anything about springs and you know how, how much they can vary, what you would do is say that you want 15 coils and you'd be done with it. Okay? So yeah, the real number is 15.06, but spring manufacturing is not that precise. Now you can get it, you can dial it in quite a bit by making a bunch of scrap, um, but a lot of times the, the specifications like this moment of an inch pound at 180 degrees, it, it's not, it needs to be about that much most of the time. So it's not really worth this 0 0.06 parts of a coil most of the time. So you just specify 15 and be done with it. Again, I'm gonna leave this as 15.06 and 15.53, but in the real world, you'd probably round those off quite a bit. Anyway, um, so the, the number of coils we'll say we need in the body is 15 or so. Now we've got a small problem here because for a, a torsion spring, as you apply load to a torsion spring and you twist it, what you usually do, you, you can apply it backwards where you're kind of opening up the coils, but most of the time that's not a very stable configuration. So most of the time what you'll do is you'll provide a uh, a moment that tends to close the coils as the spring is loaded. 
So what happens is this, the torsion spring, since you've got this, this offset moment, it'll tend to try and twist. So what you do is you, you mount a rod in the middle, right? Or maybe you, you guide the outside of it. Maybe that's why we've got this maximum outside down there. I don't know. A lot of times you put a rod. In fact, I think we were supposed to specify a rod that would fit through the middle of this. So we, we want a rod for the spring to ride on. That way when we apply force, it doesn't just you know, go out of plane and, and no longer work for us. But the problem is, as you apply load to it, those coils get smaller and smaller. And if they get too small, then the spring can't continue to do its job, right? It can't continue to decrease in situs and increase in load. Basically, you're just bending the end arms then if you apply more load. So I'd like to know what the minimum size of the spring comes out to be on the inside diameter. And so there is an equation for calculating the mean diameter of the spring at the operating position. It is on uh, page 620 and it is equation 1817. And it goes like this. It says that the mean diameter in the operating, or the, uh, not, yeah, uh, let's see. Let me see. Yeah. The mean diameter at the operating position, and I've added this operating position to the specification because if you think about it, if you take this torsion spring and you just keep compressing it, theoretically the coils would just keep getting smaller and smaller. So what I really care about is the mean diameter at the operating position. Anyway, it's the mean diameter at the initial position. Now, I don't like it. Your author puts an I here. It makes it look like something different. It's not. This is simply that. It's the initial mean diameter of the spring when it's made, when it's unloaded. Okay? So you might want to make a note of that because it can be confusing about what dm and dmi are in equation 1817. What he labels dm, he's got it like this. Well, your initial thought is that this goes in here, right? Because aren't they the same thing? Well, no, they're not. This is sort of the, the minimum diameter that you can expect when the spring is at the operating position. And then this is really the mean diameter. So I, I bring this up because you should probably make some notes around equation 1817. I mean, he has some good notes there. You just read them. But in the stress of a test or late at night trying to get problems done, you, you might not notice this. So anyway, let's continue with the equation. It goes like this. Uh, number of active coils over number of active plus the operating deflection. Okay. Now the more the deflection, the lower this uh, number is going to go. So you notice that I'm putting in the, the position I care about, the position I'm trying to design for. If somebody abuses the spring, there's not much I can do about it. So the mean diameter is 0 0.45 when the spring was built. The number of active coils. Uh, now you got to be careful here because the number of active coils is here, but these arms here are not contributing to the, the size change, right? So I went ahead and I plugged in the number of active coils directly, but really I should have probably plugged in the number of body coils. That would have been better. So I'll give you my number. But I would suggest when you work this that you use 15.06 rather than 15.53. The difference is not large. Okay? It's not a large difference at all. But more appropriately, I think this should be the number of body coils in both. Okay? So you might want to make that change to the equation as well. Anyway, so a half of a revolution, because I understand you can't add apples and oranges, so if this is revolutions of coil, then I need revolutions of, of uh, deflection. And so this comes out to about 0 0.436. I'll show you why I don't care too much about NB versus NA. Remember that rods come in standard sizes just like wire do. Now, I can pay somebody to put some material on a lathe, maybe half-inch stock, and turn it down to 0.436, but why would I do that? I don't care that the outside diameter of this thing be, you know, very precise. And, oh, by the way, I forgot one thing. This is the mean diameter anyway. This is at the middle of the spring, right? I'm not interested in the middle of the spring. I'm interested in the inside diameter. 
So the minimum inside diameter would be this number, right, 0 0.436 inches minus the wire diameter, so 0 0.0475 inches. Understand that's the wire diameter. And so that difference is about 0 0.388 inches. Now, now I'll make the argument I was trying to make before, but I forgot I was at the mean diameter rather than the in, inside diameter. I could pay someone to make a rod this size, but why bother? Why not get something off the shelf that, you know, I don't care too much about the surface finish. It doesn't have to be all that precise. I could choose something smaller than this. Now, there is a rule of thumb here, and I don't remember where your author has it exactly. Uh, let's see. It's in here somewhere. Here it is. On page 620, beneath equation 1817 and 1818, torsion spring is 0.4. Torsion springs must be supported at three or more points, usually installed around a rod to provide location, transfer reaction forces to structure. Rod diameter should be about 90% of the inside diameter of the spring at maximum load. So this is the inside diameter of the spring at maximum load. My rod diameter should be no more than 90% of that. So I really need to take 90%. So 90% of ID minimum is 0 0.35 inches roughly. Now I would like to make a, now I think I left it at this in my solution, but I would like to choose a rod that doesn't require any machine, just a stock rod. So rods come in a couple of sizes. You can get a quarter inch, that's 0.25. That might be okay here, but that's pretty sloppy. Uh, 0 0.375 is 3 eighths. That's too, uh, too large, obviously. I'd probably go halfway between. So halfway between a quarter and 3 eighths would be what, 5 sixteenths? 5 sixteenths, you probably don't have this memorized, but a 5 sixteenths inch rod is 0 0.3125 inches. Now, <laughs> probably these two numbers are in question, right? That two and that five. But I would probably go with a 5 16th rod to mount this on just because I can buy it off the shelf and it doesn't require any machine. And it'll give me less than 90%, but this is not something where you're saying you have to have exactly 90%. It's just about 90%. If Let's say the standard size of rod was 0.36 for some reason, okay? I would use a 0.36 rod for this without, without hesitation, right? Because I know I've got enough clearance between the minimum inside diameter of the torsion spring and a 0.36 rod. Now, obviously, 0.36 is not a standard size. So I'll go with 5 sixteenths and be done with this problem. 